This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Thank you for joining us today. The message that you're about to see is a part of a seven message series that I did on the feasts of the Lord. In the book of Leviticus chapter number 23, Moses tells the people of God that there are seven different feasts that they are to observe and that these feasts have a threefold purpose. They have a past purpose. I want you to remember something. They have a present purpose. I want you to teach your children. But then they have a prophetic purpose. And I go into that prophetic purpose in each of these seven messages. So I want you to stay tuned. I want you to hear how each of these messages tell us about the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection. We look at the Feast of Pentecost. We look at the Feast of First Fruits. We look at the Feast of Trumpets, how they prove the rapture of the church, the birth of the church, and then the tribulation, and ultimately the reign of Christ in Jerusalem. I want you to stay tuned at the end of this message. The announcer is going to come on and tell how you can get your copy of this. But let's go now into this series of messages on the Feasts of the Lord. This morning, I'm going to show you the Feast of First Fruits out of the book of Leviticus chapter number 23. This is the third feast that God tells the people of Israel to, to, to recognize. The first one was the Feast of Passover. That was to be recognized on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Abib. The very next day, on that day that followed, they were to began the seven-day feast, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These were the two feasts, and this is the way that they went in that exact order. But these all happened within one entire festival that they celebrated, and they overlapped this and called this whole time the Feast of Passover. Now, the 14th day, they celebrated the Passover. The 15th day, they celebrated Unleavened Bread. On the 17th day of that same week, or the same month, within that same week, they began celebrating what was called the wave offering, or the feast of the first fruits. During this festival of Passover, which is where we are, they would bring and have barley. This is our barley. What they would do is when they would plant the seed, Whenever they would put the seed in the ground, that first fruit that would come up out of the ground, they would gather that barley into a, a bundle, and they called it a sheaf. And when they gathered that sheaf, they had one job to do with that sheaf. They would take that barley sheaf, and they would take it to the temple in Jerusalem. And as they would go up to the temple, they would bring with them a lamb. And they would take the lamb to the altar and they would shed the blood of the lamb. And as the blood of the lamb was being poured out on the altar, they would take the first fruits and they would raise it up and they would wave it before the Lord. And it was called a wave offering. And this is how they praised the Lord. Are you ready? 
They praised the Lord by lifting their hands and with the blood of the Lamb upon the altar. God said, I want you to start out your year and start out your season by waving your hands before me and with the blood of the Lamb of God. Brothers and sisters, that is what God desires from every one of us. You cannot praise the Lord without uplifted hands and without the blood of the Lamb of God shed upon the doorpost of your soul. And so they would wave that. And as they were waving that barley, now you've got to use your imagination that these yellow petunias, daisies, or two, whatever these things are, You've got to use your imagination that these are barley. I've got to get something that looks a little more like barley. I can't lift that one. That weighs 80 pounds. We'll take it. This has got rocks in it. Lord, have mercy. What are we doing at this church? There we go. Thank you, Jesus. There we go. They would take that barley and they would wave it before the Lord. They had to realize as they were waving it, remember, every one of the feasts had three messages. It had a past message, it had a present message, and it had a future message. Every aspect of it. They were telling a story as they were waving it. And it was three parts to that story. Number one, the first part of that, when they would wave that, this is what they were saying. The Lord has given us this seed. You do realize that every good gift and every perfect gift, it comes from above and as they were waving that they were saying we're not the ones that made this come up out of the ground it was God that gave us this fruit and it is God that can take it away number two the second message not was just that God has given but number two the seed has arisen they were saying the seed that we put in the ground that was dead in the ground it has risen up three days after the Passover and they were saying that the seed has arisen up. The third thing they were saying, and this is a big one, honey, that I'm going to come back to. The third thing they were saying as they would wave that wave offering before God, they were saying this is just a little bit of the rest of it that's coming. The old timers said it like this. They said there's more where that came from. Those are the three messages. And I got five points. I'm going to do my best to get through point one. But if I can get to point three, four, and five, we may have us an old-fashioned Pentecost time in the house of God this morning. Number one, the first lesson of the wave or the first fruits, it is pointing us. Remember, it had three messages pointing to what God did, pointing to what God is doing, and pointing to what God wanted to do. What was the future message of this wave offering? What was the future message of this feast of first fruits? Number one, it was pointing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice what day this feast took place on. It took place on the 17th day of the month of Habib. It took place three days after the Passover. And if the Passover is pointing us to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, what happened three days after Jesus Christ was put into the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. This is what happened. He came up out of that grave and he was the wave offering of God to the entire world. Here is what you've got to understand. Do you remember what that season was that they celebrated at Passover? What is the that what is that harvest? It was the barley harvest. Remember what we've got in our imagination class? We've got the barley in the hand. There were two things that were pleasant about barley that were not so about wheat and they were not so about olives. Two things. Let me give them to you right quick. Number one, barley was a drought resistant fruit. It did not matter how much it rained and it didn't matter how little it rained. It could be as dry as a bone or it could be as wet as a flood. But barley would always come up out of the ground in Israel. Can I tell you something? It didn't matter how sinful the land was and it didn't matter how holy the land was. Christ couldn't get any holier and he could not have one ounce of sin in him. He is drought resistant. There was nothing the devil could do to stop him. 
It was nothing the demons could do to stop him. It was nothing the Baptists could do to stop him. On that third resurrection morning, honey, God got him up out of that grave and he took him and he waved him before the world as God's wave offering. He is the first fruits of them that slept. The second thing about barley, do you know what they called barley? They called barley the poor man's bread because it came up first and that is what poor people would go out into the field and they could gather. They could gather barley. Do you remember what it said about Sister Ruth and Sister Naomi that they came back to Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest? Do you know what kind of field she was snooping out in the fields of Boaz? She was in his barley fields and she got a whole case full of that barley. Barley is a poor man's bread. Aren't you glad Jesus isn't just a savior for the smart man but he's the savior of the dumb man. He's not just the savior of the rich man. He's the savior of the poor man. He's not just the savior of the good man. He's the savior of the bad man. And Jesus Christ got up out of that grave and was resurrected and waved before the entire world. He's God's first fruits of them that slept. The second picture of this that God is trying to show you and I is not just the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the resurrection of the children of God. The resurrection of the children of God. Remember what I said just a second ago. Whenever they would wave the first fruits, you know what they were telling the world? There's more where that came from. There's a third picture that is symbolic in those feasts of first fruit. Number three, it was the visibility of praise. Whenever they would come to the tabernacle, whenever they would come to the temple, them waving their offering before the Lord, it was their way of letting the world know whose God they really served. It was their way of letting the world know I'm on Yahweh's side. They didn't want anybody to ever doubt who gave them the first fruits of that. They didn't want anybody to ever wonder where it is that this came from. They were to be God's messenger and they were to be God's vessel that He is the real God of heaven. Let me just stop and park my Baptist boat in the Pentecostal pond of your soul. Can I tell you what the problem in this old-fashioned church and the new wave church of today? We have got this problem. We are so blessed ashamed of the God that birthed us and the God that saved us. We don't care that He bled and died. We don't care that He did this for us. All we care about is what brother so-and-so or what the person down the work, what that thing. I don't, I, 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 I don't give a flip what they think about me. They didn't die for me. You say you act crazy. You act off of your mind. No, my friend, I know I got hooked up to another world. I know which citizenship, what side of the river my citizenship's on. And when I come into the sanctuary, I don't want anybody to ever doubt whose side I'm on. I want when I lift up my hands in the sanctuary, I want them to know that God is the giver of life to me when I lift up my hands in the sanctuary when that choir lifts up their hands in the sanctuary when those people out there lift up their hands in the sanctuary we want people to know we agree with what they're saying we agree with the word of God we love the God that saved us ladies and gentlemen I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being ashamed of the God that saved my soul I'm not going to be ashamed of him it's his blood on my soul it's his blood blood on my life. It's his blood in my heart. I'm riding down the road and we get so nervous and we get so ashamed when they put that music on the on the, the iTunes or iPod or whatever you have today and, 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 and they put that on there and we're riding down the road and we start tapping that wheel, start tapping them thumbs, start going and next thing we know we're kindly bobbing back and forth and the next thing we know we kindly are doing this number right here, eyes open of course and we're just kindly going like this riding down the road and the next 
thing we know, our foots are tapping. And the next thing we know, our elbows are tapping. And the next thing we know, it's kindly rising up on the inside of us. And then we get to going and we start singing. And we don't care who's around. We're just riding down the road, going as fast as we can. But then we pull up to that blessed stoplight and we get this something inside of us. It says, they're watching you. And as soon as we turn and realize somebody's watching us, we stop doing it. We want to act sane. Number one, can I just go ahead and address something in your poor pitiful little soul? They already think you're crazy. You may as well keep the train going on down the line. Let me address something to this side of the audience. They don't know you. They're never going to see you again. And what they are wondering is, what made them so happy? I've got to get me a little bit of that. Ladies and gentlemen, let us be the type of people that will be willing to lift up our hands in the sanctuary and lift up our hands and say we're not ashamed to glorify and praise the God that saved us. You say that makes me nervous. I'll tell you why it makes you nervous. All you've got to do is do one of these every now and again. Just kind of get it up right there. And then once you feel a little bit more, you raise it up to your shoulder level. And then when you see somebody, don't, I'm not asking you to do it by yourself. I'm telling you when the other saints of God get to doing it. And then lift it up to your ear level. And then next time you feel it, lift it up past your hair. And the next thing you know, honey, you'll be lifting up so high, your arms will be flailing in the air, and you'll be waving your hands. And that is the offering of the first fruits, the wave offering to the God of heaven. He said, I want my people to praise me. The fourth thing that is so important that God wants us to learn from the feasts of first fruit. Number four, and I do recommend that there'll be some crickets come in the room right here, but that'll be okay. It's the importance of giving God the first. It is the importance of giving God the first. The first fruits were exactly that. The first thing that came up out of the ground belonged to God. The first barley loaf, it belonged to God and it was to be laid in the temple as an offering to God. Now, I, I'm going to go ahead and I will address the proverbial elephant in the room. I know preachers and I know people on TV. They are hung up on money and all they want is your money. Can I go ahead and say something? I don't have a private jet and my car's paid off. Okay, I paid on it for five years like the rest of you people have to pay on your cars for five years. And I paid on it myself. I, don't, I didn't come for your money, all right? I don't want your money. I don't give a flip about your money. It does, I don't have private jets. I'm wearing the same underwear I've been wearing for five years. I wash them, of course, but they're clean. Let's go ahead and address all that. I've had this suit for five years. I ain't going to have it much longer. I'm getting a little fat, but it's okay. I've had this. I, so let's go ahead and address the monkey in the room, right? We good on that? Okay. Let me explain to you, everything that is first in the Bible belonged to God. The first child belonged to God. The very first of everything you have, not just money, your time, not just time, your energy. That's why I'm a huge proponent. If you're, a, if you're strong in the morning, give your morning to God. If you're good at night, Lord God, you people that stay, I had buddies that come up, I had people that came over to my house on Friday night. Now, I am a proverbial 9.30 in the bed, 4 o'clock up in the morning. Thank you, Chad. God bless you, son. I appreciate that. You people that can last all night, there's something wrong with you. If you're strongest at the nighttime hour, that's what you need to give to God. I'm going to tell you something. People always ask me, and Preacher Kanoi, I'll borrow a line from Brother Kanoi. People always say, should I tithe before tax or after tax? And Preacher Kanoi used to say, do you want God to bless you before tax or after tax? <laughs> the first of everything. You want to bring a curse upon your family? Take what belongs to God in anything. God gives you a child. You don't give that child to the Lord. Watch God bring a curse upon your family. You take that finances. You take that time. You say, I can't afford to. You can't afford not to. You give God what belongs to Him. Time, energy, money, whatever it is, give it to God. Can you imagine? They'd be calling for a drought in Israel as they brought that first fruit. Can you imagine them saying, I really could use that. Look, I understand things get tight. Look, I'm with you. I got you. I live in the same world you live in. 
I am not insulated from the problems we all have. But I promise you, we're going to go through famine with or without God. I'd rather go through it knowing I had done my part to give God. Because this is what God said. You give it to me and ye shall not lack what you need. He didn't say you always going to have what you want. God never said that. And those preachers that tell you that are lying through their ever-loving golden teeth. They are liars. But God did say I'd take care of my own. The fifth thing, let me give this to you right quickly. And this is one that God put in my soul and I pray it's going to help somebody this morning. The fifth thing that the Feast of First Fruit taught was the importance of faith when you pray. Now watch this. When they brought the wave offering to God, this is what they were saying. They were saying, Lord, I am testifying to the world that you are going to give me more than this right here. Where is it? It hadn't come up out of the ground yet. But I know there's more. How can you say God's going to give more? Because he told me he was. This is a sign of the first fruits. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. How many times has God answered our prayer? God given us, and I, I, I can walk through people, I can show people in this room, God's answered your prayers, God's helped you, God's strengthened you, and it builds up and builds up. And the first calamity that comes our way, why does it deplete the bank account of our faith? I'm talking about God answers prayer, God answers prayer, God answers prayer. Boom! No faith. God wanted them to know, you can trust me to send the harvest because of what you hold in your hand. I, there are more answered prayers in this room right here. People that I have personally prayed for, people that I have personally went and ministered to. It, people in this room that have walked and talked. I've dealt with you, I've talked to you, I've prayed with you, and I've seen God answer your prayers. Why are you still doubting that God is able? And then it rises up inside of us and, and then we get these... How many of you love it when you try to outsmart God? Oh my, I've tried that more times than not. I love making little lines like this to God. God, I know you're able, but I just don't know if it's your will. God, I know you're able but I just don't know if you're willing to do it. How many times have we tried to fool God with our little catchy phrases? Let me put a verse in your soul. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please God. That is why God gives you the first fruit of what He's that's why God's giving you that little nugget of answered prayer. So that you will believe Him for something greater, for His glory. You say, but what if God is not willing? I've got a verse for you. You ready? Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. And all things. What does all mean in Greek? What's all mean in Greek class? It means all. I can't tell you how many people have come up and said, I just don't know if it's God's will for me to have a baby. I said, are you married? I need to laugh about that. I said, are you married? I said, God said it is a noble thing to desire to have a family. Ask Him for it. But I don't know if it's His will. All means all. You say, what if I can't have a baby? There are babies everywhere that need a mama and a daddy to adopt them. And do not let the devil discourage you because you got a child through a paper. Listen, I talked to a lot of women that went through birth. And I'm pretty sure they'd rather be in your boat than you in their boat when it comes to the pain, gore, and nasty level. It doesn't matter. God answers prayer His own way. What does all mean? All means. 
Now that if it ended there, we would be happy, wouldn't we? But notice what he said next. And all things whatsoever. God's people, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ever more convinced of this if I can bear my heart for 30 seconds. I'm ever more convinced of this that the way that God is going to separate the real church of Christ in our day and the false church of Christ in our day is through supernatural answers of prayer. I'm not talking about these big waves of money. No, no, no. I'm talking about people being healed. I'm talking about people being chained. I'm talking about drunks getting sober like that. I'm talking about people getting out of drug houses like that. I'm talking about people that were gangbangers. I'm talking about gang leaders that become preachers of the gospel. I'm talking about young men that had their life entirely set and God stampeding them in their bedroom and showing them the power of Christ and sending them in a way. I'm telling you right now what's going to separate the true church of Jesus Christ in our day from the false church is going to be the supernatural moving of the Holy Ghost through the people of God praying. Mark my word. You're going to have people that are going to rise up and they're going to say, God healed me. I don't know how. I, don't, I can't explain it, but God healed me. You're going to have people rise up and they're going to say, I was on my way to do this and God called me to preach. I heard the Lord. He called me. There's going to be stories in this church and in churches around here. The true church of Christ. There are going to be women that say, I was about ready to walk out and God told me not to. There are going to be men that say, God, I was about to leave, but Christ wouldn't let me. It will be the supernatural. But what you've got to understand is that that fruit was all started by some little mother in a back room somewhere. Waving her faith to God. Waving her faith to God. Saying, God, that boy is getting ready to leave. She's waving that faith to God. Saying, God, I know you can do it. Those people that, those people that are off of those bar stools and those people, they don't just get off of those. Some little grandmother, some little daddy is in his back room. Waving their faith before God as a first fruit. I don't know who you are today and I don't know why you come. But God wants you to know He's still alive. He's still real. He's still on the throne. He's still listening to your prayers. Do not throw in the towel on God. In Pastor Tyler's latest series, He explains the Feast of the Lord and their past, present, and prophetic purpose in our lives today. We would like to send you a CD or DVD set of the Feast of the Lord with your gift of any amount in support of this program. You can call us, write us, or email us at the information on your screen to get your set today. Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast on this station through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. Would you consider becoming a monthly partner of Unspeakable Joy? You may mail your gifts to Unspeakable Joy, 3113 North Church Street, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27405. Or you can give online at unspeakablejoytv.com. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need, that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.